From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Sarah Lancaster will go over the multiple considerations when mapping out a pre-emergence herbicide program for corn stands. She'll talk about the categories of herbicides labeled for pre-emergence treatments and how they tend to perform. Also today from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen will talk about the part of the federal tax code which addresses farm business asset sales, known as Section 1231. And he'll discuss how this can be of great benefit to you agricultural producers as long as its provisions are met. And K-State's Gus Vanderhoven awaits with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned into the midweek edition of Agriculture Today. Glad to have you listening once more as, again, we are edging ever closer to the corn production season in Kansas. And for those of you who are inclined to use a pre-emergence control program for your weed issues, what we have next is right up that alley. Joining us once more is weed management specialist Sarah Lancaster of K-State Research and Extension. And she is putting out an article on this very topic in the upcoming e-update newsletter. So Sarah, this is a strategy that is uh, highly endorsed, but what are we trying to accomplish with pre-emergence herbicides ahead of corn seeding? Yeah, so let's do a little bit of kind of vocabulary or semantics, Eric. So when we talk about pre-emergent herbicides, you know, we could be talking about herbicides either that are applied before the crop comes up or before the weeds come up. Or very often we use that term to talk about something that I kind of like to call residual herbicides. So these are herbicides that have activity in the soil. So typically they control weeds before they come up, not after. So the name of the game here is to try to prevent emergence of early season weeds that are going to cause potential yield reductions. So, you know, I know that that one pass at early post timing, you know, kind of V2-ish corn is a super popular thing to do just because of time management. And if you choose to go that route, it's really important to make sure that you were clean when you planted and that you've got some sort of residual product, multiple residual products in that that herbicide application. But the pre and post can complement each other, or is it one or the other? You know, in a weed scientist's dream world, (laughs) farmers would be going out with a pre-emergent herbicide at planting, and then coming back with more of a a mid-post treatment or maybe a late-post treatment, so somewhere, you know, V4, V6, V8, somewhere in that, um, as far as your corn growth stages go. So, you know, again, those pre-emergent applications are just so important for preventing that early season weed competition that leads to yield loss. Well, then, the considerations that go into product selection for the pre-emergence application here, several alternatives here, where does one start with their decisions? Obviously, the likely target weeds one's expecting, right? Right. So, you know, you have to think about what weeds you have. You know, one of the sort of downfalls of the Roundup Ready Easy Button system is I think we forgot about weed identification and weed ecology and biology. And so as we think about, you know, losing some of our herbicide tools, that's becoming more important again. So absolutely, you know, weed ID and and knowing what's out there and and when it's best controlled is, is step number one for any weed management program. As we think about herbicide options, in corn, atrazine is kind of the, the backbone, right? Atrazine's the backbone of a lot of our corn and sorghum weed management systems. And so a lot of our, our recommendations are going to include atrazine. It has good efficacy on a variety of weeds. As long as you don't have triazine resistance, it's good on pigweeds. 
So atrazine is kind of one of those exceptions to the rule. You know, I said that residual herbicides typically control weeds before they come up. Mm. Well, atrazine actually is going to control weeds after they come up because of how it works. It's taken in through the roots and it interferes with photosynthesis, which only occurs when the plants are above ground. So um, it's a little different in terms of how it works um, relative to some of the other kind of foundational products that we think about in a lot of our pre-emergent corn systems. And you're hinting at mode of action, and we'll talk about that specifically as we go along here. But atrazine should be included as a tank mix with other options to broaden the spectrum of control. That's right, Eric. So a couple of other groups of herbicides that are pretty foundational for our corn programs. One would be what we call the group 27 or the um, HPPD inhibiting herbicides. These are the bleachers, things like balance. Um, One of the things we know about those HPPD inhibiting herbicides is that they benefit from having atrazine in the tank mix. It's a a phenomenon that we call synergism. So they actually work better than you would expect when you have that that atrazine in the mix with those group 27 products like isoxaflutal and, and others. The other foundational group of herbicides, whether we're talking about corn, sorghum, or soybeans, would be group 15 or the acetamide herbicides. So this would be things like esmetolachlor or dual. One of the newer herbicides in that group would be pyroxysulfone or zidua. So pyroxysulfone is a component of a variety of different products. It is in that group as well. So these group 15 herbicides, they are seedling shoot inhibitors. So when you apply them, those weeds do not emerge. They're really good on on small seeded broadleaves and grasses. They're not super awesome on our pigweeds, but they do have some activity on palmer amaranth and and can get you a good ways towards control of palmer. But that isn't the all-inclusive list of options here, is it? There are a couple of other categories that might fill the bill. That's right. A couple of other different groups of herbicides to consider would be uh, what we call group 14s or PPO inhibiting products. So, you know, we think about flumioxazin or Valor as being an early pre-plant option, but there are also products like Sharpen, which is the active ingredient saflufenacil, um, that are in this category that can be effective as well. Another group would be ALS inhibiting products. Um, we often refer to these as group two products. They still have utility in our corn and soybean systems, but the widespread resistance to these herbicides in a lot of our kiwis has reduced their prominence in our system. So they're still a good component. They still bring some some things to the table as a tank mix partner, as a component of a premix product, but they're not not quite as prominent as they would have been in years past. Of course, the Chemical Weed Control Guide out of K-State will have detailed information on all of these categories, and and it's important that producers study that information as they formulate their plan here. Just asking this, Sarah, if one is wanting maximum residual activity, uh, if they're concerned about stand emergence, their corn might not get going, might not be competitive early, what route should one go here? So if you think about long-term residual activity, you know, those combinations of that three-way mix of the atrazine, the HPPD inhibitors, and the chloracetamides, they are the industry standard. Um, some of the ALS inhibiting products can provide a little, a little longer efficacy for us, but, you know, really that, that standard is that, that combination of those three, um, something from those three groups, the atrazine with a, a group 15 and a group 27. Outside of that, one has to be pretty particular about the timing of application to make sure they get f- as much efficacy as possible here then. You know, that's right, Eric. So um, one of the things we talk about in terms of getting season-long weed control is including residual herbicides in your post-emergent applications as well. Uh, maybe that's a topic for a different <laughs> day. <laughs> we'll get into that as we get to that point. There's an important component to this, though, and we wanted to throw this in as well, Sarah, understanding those herbicide modes of action, being familiar with them, and as you piece together your control program, uh, basing it on those modes of action. There is a publication out from K-State Research and Extension that gets into that specific. That's right. So I am so excited to 
um, be able to talk to you about the revisions to the herbicide mode of action publication that has been around for a long time. We kind of added some emphasis on side of action. So weed scientists have kind of moved away from the emphasis on mode of action and started talking more about sites of action. So um, folks will see that reflected in this updated publication. And there's a difference between the two? Yeah, there actually is, Eric. So, you know, mode of action is sort of the general thing that happens to the plants after the herbicides are in the plant. So one of the most commonly known herbicides, glyphosate or Roundup, right? So we would say the mode of action for Roundup is amino acid synthesis inhibition. It stops the production of certain amino acids that are important for plant defense. But then we would go on to describe the site of action as a specific enzyme. And so the site of action would be that very specific target within the plant. Mixing and rotating herbicides from different group numbers or different sites of action is a key recommendation for managing herbicide resistance. And and on every product label, you will see that group number. So becoming familiar with those group numbers is important. And we do have some resources here that folks can use also. Um, We've got some handy posters that have um, these group numbers, and they're put together by um, the Take Action Campaign, which is funded by the United Soybean Board. As I get out and start getting to do meetings again, I will have those with me. But um, in the meantime, you can can get those from K-State, from your extension office, or um, you can actually order them online through the Take Action website. Well. Directly, this herbicide mode of action publication, it's entitled just that, out of K-State Research and Extension. The updated version is available now, and you can go to the K-State Research and Extension bookstore online, type in that title, Herbicide Modes of Action, and that'll take you right to this updated publication. And by the way, don't forget that Sarah also is regularly active in a weekly podcast. War Against Weeds is its title, and search through your podcast option of choice to find that. Sarah, thanks for talking weed control in a pre-emergent sense for corn with us right here. Thanks, Eric. My pleasure as always. Sarah Lancaster, Weed Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. You're listening to Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. For you now on this Agriculture Today, more from agricultural law and taxation professor, Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan, who's our guest every other Wednesday here on the broadcast. Roger, we're going to tap into information that you've included in your recent blog posts on the sale of farm business assets and how those are treated in tax provisions here, and and they are treated rather favorably if things fall into place. But what this really revolves around is something called Section 1231 of the tax code. And just to set the table here, what is that? Well, it's a very favorable provision of the code uh, on sale of certain assets. They get this special tax treatment. And, and basically what the tax treatment is, if you qualify as a Section 1231 asset, is that your net gains from the sale of those assets are long-term capital gains, and, and which means you get a favorable tax rate on that, less than the ordinary tax rate for most taxpayers. And uh, that current rate is zero for a certain amount uh, up to a certain level of income. Then it's 15 percent or 20 percent, depending on a combination of your income and your marital status. The uh, losses, if you have losses on your Section 1231 transactions and they exceed the gains, then that net loss is treated as an ordinary loss. So on the loss side, that's a good result, too, because for business assets, which these must be, your losses would be fully deductible. So you get lower tax rates on the gain side, and you get full deductibility on the loss side. That's why it's important to know if you have a 1231 asset. None of this is automatic. Transactions must qualify for 1231. What are those qualifiers, if you will? 
Well, your most basic principle is that the property has to be used in the taxpayer's trade or business. So it has to be business property that you're using in your farm or your ranch. You cannot hold the property for sale to customers. If you're holding it for sale to customers, it cannot be a Section 1231 asset. And the property has to be subject to depreciation and generally held for more than a year. Now, uh, you put all those in the pot and stir it up, and if you check all those boxes, then you've got a Section 1231 asset. Uh, But it's not going to pick up inventory property. It won't pick up property that's held primarily for sale to customers in the ordinary course of business. It's not going to get some non-farm things such as copyrights, although you know you, you could get into copyright issues for farmers and ranchers occasionally, or literary, musical, or artistic compositions of U.S. government publications. So it can't be that stuff. Mm-hmm. And you bear the burden to prove that your property is Section 1231 property. So you have to be able to show that you're holding the property for the right purpose, for use in your trader business, not for sale to customers in the ordinary course of business. And, and that's a point where some farmers get snagged. Uh, there was a, a tax court case a number of years ago where the court said that the sales of cattle weren't eligible for capital gain treatment because the taxpayer couldn't prove that the cattle were not held for sale to customers in the ordinary course of business or that the cattle were depreciable assets. You know, purchased cattle would be depreciable assets. So we're talking breeding stock in that, in that instance, for example. If, you're gonna, if you consider your cattle as available for sale at any time, uh, they're not going to be Section 1231 assets. So we get into little picky things mm-hmm. like that, it, but it makes a difference on how you use your assets and, of course, the reason for which you are acquiring them. As you're saying, and as outlined in your blogs on this topic, that is very tricky. What assets are for sale, what aren't. And when you get into livestock breeding stock, that's very much an interpretation of each circumstance, it seems, as case law would suggest, Roger. Yeah, it is. And the case law in this area goes back many, many decades. A lot of the the most important cases actually come out of the 1950s and the 60s. You may have issues, for example, in one case, whether bull calves between 6 and 11 months of age and heifer calves between 6 and 24 months old, raised and sold by a dairy cattle herder, were property held for sale to customers or are they property used in the taxpayer's trade or business. That's an issue that came up in that course. And in another one, another court case, that in 1952, calves of a producing herd were held not to constitute Section 1231 property. In yet another case, uh, fast forward to 1982, the issue was whether the sale of pregnant gilts were properly characterized as long-term capital gain under Section 1231. So this issue of the proper characterization of livestock and other farm assets comes up all the time. And so it's, it's good to know whether you're going to qualify for this favorable tax treatment or not so that you can modify, if necessary, your business practices to get the tax treatment that you're desiring. In general, then, having said that, again, on livestock, breeding animals, how cull animals are handled here, it seems as if those would likely qualify, but is that so? Well, they can if the farmer can show that the cold cows were no longer suitable for breeding purposes, or at least you can show that they were different from those livestock that were not sold. Um, The motive to cull is going to be the controlling factor rather than when the culling occurred or how the animals were culled. But, for example, in some of these court cases that we see, that if the culled animals, uh, let's say we're culling heifers, if they were culled shortly before the annual spring sale, that could cause the IRS to question the purpose for which the the heifers were held. And there was a South Dakota case on that point about 20 years ago, and uh, the taxpayer couldn't uh, stay out of the trial on that one. The court uh, went ahead and had trial on that, and the IRS was also asserting that the manner in which the spring sale was conducted was pretty aggressive with respect to marketing uh, strategies by the ranch. They produced a tricolor multi-page brochure. They had a dedicated phone line to the barn where people could call about the auction. They took out TV ads, radio spots, and the IRS uh, not only was saying, hmm, uh, we think those animals are not 1231 assets. You're holding them for sale to customers. Um, we, we think it's also subject to self-employment tax hmm. because of the way you were marketing that uh, spring sale. So you don't want to be too visible. 
Uh, you want to be careful in promoting and marketing the sale of cold animals. And so that's a case that we point people to all the time. We talk to practitioners about that. And, and, and you know, you've got to advise these farmers and ranchers not to go over the top uh, on this because you can get a bad tax result that you're not expecting. It's probably instructive here, Roger, to define what livestock means in the context of the Section 1231 qualification rules. Well, it's a very broad definition, so it's going to pick up just about everything, but not quite. Uh, it does include cattle, hogs, horses, mules, donkeys, sheep, goats, fur-bearing animals, other mammals. Uh, it also can include trophy deer that are raised as part of a taxpayer's trade or business of so farming. So all these types of animals... They'll meet the definition of livestock, but again, they also have to be used in the taxpayer's trade or business. But livestock does not include, for purposes of Section 1231, poultry. It doesn't include chickens and turkeys and pigeons and geese or other birds. It doesn't include fish, frogs, or reptiles. But basically, you think any mammal that's held for uh, breeding or sporting purposes or use in your trade or business is going to count, and that includes some fur-bearing animals. So chinchilla, uh, one court has said, count if they're held for breeding purposes. Mink count, fox count. Mm. But bees and other insects are not livestock. Now, there are other provisions of the tax code where bees are livestock, but not for 1231. <laughs> oh, details matter for sure here. And something that you did touch upon in a comment earlier, there is this established holding period, as it's called, that uh, livestock owners must satisfy to qualify for the 1231 tax treatment here. And you might uh, specify those numbers just for clarification. Yeah, not only do qualified livestock have to be held for a qualified purpose, they have to be held for a required amount of time. So for cattle and horses, the holding period is at least 24 months. For all other livestock, the holding period is at least 12 months. So basically a year or two, but we refer to it in months. So cattle and horses, it's 24 months, and for all the other livestock, it's 12 months. There's a great lot of detail to this, and uh, clearly over the years, much interpretation on what sorts of livestock transactions, sales of livestock assets qualify for 1231 tax treatment. Any other things that producers need to think about here to be sure where they stand on this? Yeah, Eric, what if i am got a livestock lease type situation where I'm, in essence, renting to myself? I've got an entity that might be my production entity. And then I've got either myself or another entity, and I'm leasing livestock animals in between the two. We tend to see that with breeding operations. I also get into that in my three-part series on this issue. But in terms of where farmers can go to find information on this, the IRS publication to Form 4797, the instructions to that, have uh, really good uh, worksheets. It shows you where your 1231 transactions are to be reported and how you do the netting process and then what form you carry it to for the uh, tax return. And so the instructions to 4797 are really helpful. But again, this is one of these areas where you really want to have a good tax professional helping right. you through these things. So 1231 assets, very beneficial uh, in terms of the tax provisions that apply to them, but uh, we have to structure ourselves correctly so that we can take advantage of it. And incidentally, Roger just this morning posted the third of this three-part series on farm business asset sales and this special tax treatment that is known as Section 1231. That is on his blog at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Have a look at that and uh, visit with your tax advisor likewise, as Roger says. Roger, thanks for the time and the input. We'll talk again in two weeks. Thank you, Eric. He's a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. Roger McGowan with us here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines in brief for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Japan may impose safeguard tariffs on imports of U.S. beef since the fiscal 2020 volume is expected to have gone above 242,000 metric tons with the fresh trade data due to be released today. That's according to Japanese media reports. The tariff would rise to 38.5% for one month from the current mark of just over 25%. That action would trigger consultations between the two countries within 10 days of the tariff being imposed, with the reports telling us that consultations would have to adjust to the applicable safeguard trigger to a higher level. Data for Japan's fiscal 2020 had U.S. beef imports at 233,000 metric tons at the end of February. While not commenting on whether the tariffs would be implemented, Japanese Agricultural Minister Kotaro Nogami said that any rise in fresh, chilled, and frozen U.S. beef would not likely have a major impact on consumers there in Japan, noting that any increase would be in effect for only 30 days. The last time that Japan imposed the safeguard tariffs on U.S. beef was in August of 2017. As the Biden administration seeks to deliver on its commitment to vaccinate all American adults within months, high priority must be given to vaccinating frontline meat and poultry workers and reaffirming protections that have successfully brought infection rates in the sector down more than 80 percent below the general population. That's according to a statement by the North American Meat Institute. Citing data from the Food and Environment Reporting Network, there were just four new reported cases per 100,000 meat and poultry workers per day this February. That's compared with 26 cases per 100,000 people in the general U.S. population. Independent scientific research is supporting the effectiveness of the COVID prevention measures implemented in the sector since the spring of last year. The University of Nebraska Medical Center found that the combination of universal masking and physical barriers reducing cases significantly in 62 percent of the meat facilities that were studied. An analysis published last June found that distancing of three feet and using face masks each reduced transmission by about 80 percent and using eye protection reducing transmission by about 65 percent. Well, we've heard a lot of talk of late about China's arising concerns once more with African swine fever. Now, the USDA and Canada's Food Safety Agency have developed a protocol that minimizes the impacts on trade if ASF is detected in feral swine in either of our countries. The USDA's Stephanie Ho reports. USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and Canada's Food Inspection Agency have developed a protocol to help ensure bilateral trade will continue in the event that African swine fever is detected in feral swine in either country, as long as the disease is absent from domestic swine. If ASF is detected, all U.S.-Canada swine trade would initially stop. Then, according to the protocol, trade would resume in three progressive phases with increasingly reduced restrictions. Let us consider just how far and how fast ASF has spread since 2006 when it was endemic to parts of Africa and Italy. APHIS Associate Administrator Jack Shear raised concerns about the disease during a panel discussion at USDA's annual Agricultural Outlook Forum. In 2020, India and Papua New Guinea reported their first cases, and several European countries reported new ASF incursions, including Germany. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Despite calls from Congress to help make more farmers and ranchers eligible for the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program loans, the SBA has declared now that farmers in partnerships do not get the benefit of using gross income when applying for a PPP loan. That guidance comes out with the deadline to apply for the latest round of PPP loans, March the 31st. In dealing with farm partnerships, farm groups, accountants, and members of Congress have been asking the 
the administration over the past two months to clarify whether a farm or ranch in a limited liability corporation, a qualified joint venture, or a partnership can use gross income to determine the loan amount. But in this latest guidance on the loans by the SBA, the agency stuck with its position that only self-employed farmers and ranchers who file a 1040 Schedule F with their tax returns can use gross income to determine the loan amount. A farmer or rancher who is a single member of an LLC or a qualified joint venture, as defined by the IRS, and would file a Schedule F can use gross income to determine that loan amount. The IRS added that only one spouse in a qualified joint venture may submit a PPP loan application on behalf of that joint venture. Now, senators had been writing Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen for a more lenient interpretation of how farmers and partnerships could use gross income to apply for the loans. Since PPP loans were launched a year ago, businesses in agriculture as well as fishery and forestry only account for about one and a half percent of the program's national loan volume. PPP loans are forgivable as long as 60 percent or more of the proceeds are spent on approved expenses. Input from Kansas ranchers is being sought on pasture availability and leasing rates. Scarlett Hagen says that survey is closing soon. The Kansas Department of Agriculture is seeking to collect information on native tall grass pasture use and practices through the 2021 Blue Stem Pasture Survey. It is administered by the Kansas State University Land Use Survey Center and will be open through March 31st. The Blue Stem Pasture Survey provides reliable, accurate information to Kansas ranchers and the agricultural community as a whole by asking about native tall grass pasture availability and leasing and fencing rates. The native tall grass region of Kansas is a large, relatively intact grassland region, including 14 counties, which provides rich grazing opportunities for cattle producers. This biennial survey collects data that is used to provide a baseline comparison and can aid landowners and renters when entering into lease agreements. According to Kansas Secretary of Agriculture Mike Beam, underwriting this survey tool is one way the Kansas Department of Agriculture works to provide useful data that supports the state's agriculture industry. The survey should take less than 15 minutes to complete and is voluntary, anonymous, and confidential. To access the online version, go to tinyurl.com backslash bluestem2021. To receive a written survey or to complete it over the phone, contact the Land Use Survey Center or the Kansas Department of Agriculture. I'm Scarlett Hagens. And further, you can learn more about that survey by going to agmanager.info here at K-State, agmanager.info. This is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. That early morning, it was different. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Years ago, I flew into Amsterdam, coming from Chicago, approaching Skip Hall, the international airport, the plane slowly descended. There are no mountains there. If anything, there's fog, rain, and early in the morning darkness. But that early morning, it was different. It was still dark outside. But as we crossed the narrow strip of dunes, I could see below, and all of a sudden, all was light. A soft yellow orange light shining up out of the thousands of greenhouses passing below us. It was light. We were slowly passing over what the Dutch call Westland. It's a fascinating part of the Netherlands with the highly productive greenhouse industry producing for the export. 
It's all close to Aalsmeer, the huge auction house from where products are shipped all over the world. It is from there that I can buy Dutch cut flowers, fresh tulips, here in Manhattan at Dillon's. But it is the light coming up from below that I still remember. It came from miles, many square miles, with acres and acres of greenhouses all lit up and producing. Soon the plane banked and we touched ground. We were in the Netherlands, a small country, only one-sixth the size of Kansas, with 17-plus million people. It's a small country with a lot of energy and many sounds, which I will call noise. There's a rule that planes cannot fly over Amsterdam, take over land during certain hours of the night. It is noise control. Recently, I've read more about both noise and light and what too much can do to us and nature. It's not only men we worry about. Birds and other critters do not know anymore when they should rest in an over-lighted environment. This is no joke. Birds have been known to keep on flying until they drop dead. That early morning, flying in over the acres and acres of lit-up greenhouses, I understood there was no night. But scary as this sounds, there are still places, small as they are, but large enough for the walker where one can come to rest in silence where thoughts can be thought and shared with a walking friend, or for that matter, can be finished on a bench sitting in the sun out of the wind. A friend emailed me and shared that she had walked a path near the old castle. It's Hackford, near Vorden, Gelderland. The castle is from before the 13th century. It has a history of destruction and rebuilding. Today it is still known as the castle, but it has been restored and changed with modern conveniences. I was lucky to have worked on the largest farm of the estate. Today, that farm and large dairy has comfortable free-run stalls next to the old farmstead where cows were held in winter in stanchions. They were well cared for and produced lots of milk, but they did not move much. It's all different now. It is there I met my friend, but I never noticed her. She was the daughter of the farm family I worked for. She was then seven years old. It is our shared deep love for the culture, the history and nature of the estate what connects us today by email and her ability to take photos and forward them to me. In a recent email, she shared that she had walked the Hackford path with her adopted daughter, now in her 40s. The daughter had cancer. This was the third time. The third treatment she went through. They needed to walk. They needed to talk. They did. The interesting thing is that in my mind, I could follow them slowly walking, talking, sharing. The other thing is, if I met my friend on the street, I would not recognize her. I haven't seen her for 70 years. And if I saw her at all, I never noticed her in 1951. I was busy working on the land in the stalls, and I loved it. I felt the long history the deep culture in agriculture. And in the woods and on the land, I knew silence, darkness, and dusk. There were the animals, both domesticated and wild. There were no bears, but there were deer, foxes, and more. I remember one snowy Sunday walking in the back of the woods. I stumbled on a live trap set to catch a hawk by the forester. In the trap there was a pigeon walking nervously in a small compartment as a lure to catch the hawk. The hawk had been caught and was trapped 
in its compartment with the door closed. I looked at his fiery eyes. It tried to flap its wings in the small trap. It was snowing. All was very quiet. I quickly made up my mind and opened the trap door and gave the hawk its freedom. In a moment, it flew off through the silent, falling snow. Oh, I felt good and went my way. It is this silence we all need, as well as the darkness. We in Kansas are lucky. We have it, and we can live by it and stay well. I remember driving in western Kansas at night and enjoying the darkness. The same on the farm, the silence, the starry nights. It heals us, keeps us in balance. As creators of the human environment, we should keep silence and darkness in mind. We need it. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. Thanks, as always, for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.